Endurance Junkie Podcast, Episode 104. Brought to you by Health IQ, an insurance company that helps health conscious people get special life insurance rates. Go to healthiq.com forward slash junkie to support the show and learn more. Hey Junkies, how are you doing? My name is Peter and thanks for joining me on a new episode of the Endurance Junkie Podcast, the show where I will be interviewing some of the fastest, smartest and most inspiring people active in the endurance world today. Now before we get going, I would quickly like to thank Health IQ for supporting. Now many people in the endurance community have had trouble with how much they pay for their life insurance. And despite their own health conscious lifestyle, they might get penalized for family history and BMI and stuff like that. Well, Health IQ has decided to change all that. And they use science and data to secure you lower rates on your life insurance. A bit like saving money on your car insurance for being a good driver, Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a healthy lifestyle. Now to see if you qualify and get a free code today, just go to healthiq.com forward slash junkie. That's healthiq.com forward slash junkie and maybe save over a thousand dollars on your yearly premium. Joe McAvoy is a former high profile arm rubber who has found redemption through this power of sport. Having broken some world indoor rowing records while still in prison, he is now forging a life as an endurance athlete, coach and a speaker. And John hopes that his story of rehabilitation can help inspire others to change their lives for the better. So hi John, thanks for coming on the show. Now for those of us who don't know you, can you maybe start off by telling us a bit about yourself and um, your not so sporting background growing up? Hello, um, yeah, thanks for inviting me on the show. A massive like, sort of privilege and honor. Um, so I wasn't uh, an, like, an athletic child. I didn't have any aspirations to be an athlete when I was, when I was gonna, when I got older. Um, I was probably a little bit overweight when I was a little kid. I used to probably sit in front of the computer more than I went outside. And sort of the, 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 the qualities that I did have, though, was my real father, my biologi- biological father, passed away before I was born. And um, my, when I used to go to school, my mum explained to me one day that my dad passed away because kids at school used to tease me that I didn't have a dad. And, and I thought it was quite normal not to have like a, uh, a dad at home. I have a male in, indoors because I was brought up by my mum and my stepsister. So my mum explained to me about my father passed away and and kind of then I had, I had sort of an understanding from a very young age and I must have been about five years old that, that what death was and I understood that one day I, I wouldn't be here on earth and I understand that none of us would be. And around that sort of time, like I really developed like a, a fascination with history and I remember I used to read all these books, these historical books when I was a little boy. And my mum used to get me these magazines called Discoveries. And every month it was like a little different section of history. And I used to read these magazines. And, and I remember I, I, could quite, quite, I could comprehend that all these people that I was reading about were all dead. And, but people were still talking about them. People wrote magazines and people wrote books about them. And, and, and I didn't know what the word was because I was too young. But the word was like legacy. And people remembered them after they were gone. Um, and sort of through that, um, I kind of, that's what I wanted when I got older. And and I kind of, I, I, again, I was very, I wanted to do something in my life when I was a little kid. I wanted to be successful when I was an adult. I wanted to achieve something. And from a very sort of young age that I made this connection between money and wealth and success. Um, a lot, A lot of that was to do with sort of, watching tv and and i i used to watch these adverts um there was a there was a famous advert in britain on um, british telecom and uh, i used to sit in front of the tv and watch these adverts and british telecom basically had a, a monopoly over the phone communication system in this country and when i used to watch this these adverts it was like bt was just this massive beacon of of money and and i said to my uncle one day i said how much money do they make and he said they make billions and and when he said that to me from that moment onwards I thought to myself, when I get older, I'm going to own British Telecom and I'm going to be a billionaire. And that is sort of how sort of ambitious 
I was as a little boy. Like when I got older, I wanted to be wealthy because to me, wealth meant success. And when I got to eight years old, um, a man come into my life. And as I said, up until this point, my, my real father passed away. There'd never really been any sort of mouths in our house other than my uncles on both sides of my, my family. Um, and this man come into my life and, and, and basically he was my stepsister's father. And I didn't really understand who he was or what he was. And, and my mum explained she was married to him when, when, before I was born. And it transpired that this man um, had just been released from serving a massive prison sentence for armed robbery. Um, he'd finished off serving a 16-year prison sentence for it. And it transpired that he was, he was very prolific as an armed robber in the United Kingdom. Um, five acquittals at the Old Bailey. The police tried to kill him. Well, they tried to shoot him two times. Uh, so he, he was very, very well known in the sort of the criminal underworld of, of this country. And he kind of started taking me under his wing because he didn't have a son. He started taking me out when he used to take my sister out. And he started basically, he brought me up as his son. And obviously he was giving, he was, he was exposing me to a lot of people. Um, at the time, I was too young to really understand what they'd done. But obviously they were, they were involved in very serious and organised crime. Um, very wealthy. Uh, they always seemed to be very well respected when I was around them, the way other people treated them. Um, they sort of, they had all the trappings of, of success. What I thought success was as a little boy, watches, cars, houses. Um, but what was happening, the more time and, and a little, little, little bit older that I ended up getting around these sort of men, the way they perceived the world is then how I then started perceiving it because they was, show, they was telling me this is how the world was. Um, and it was basically like, um, if you ever, if, if you ever get in trouble, you, you never tell towels on your friends, you never grasp on them. Um, if you ever get arrested, you don't tell the police anything. Um, and it was all these sort of morals that criminals will have. And, and to me that, that was normal. That, that was, was life. Normal, yeah. Um, yeah, that was, it was completely and utterly normal to be like that. And, and sort of then I then up to this point, like I, I, I wanted to be a businessman. I wanted to be successful. Um, I went to achieve something in my life, but the more older I got and the more I was spending around these men, I started having an awareness of what they were doing and the reasons why they was telling me not to talk to police and not to do this and not to tell towels on my friends if I ever got in trouble. And we sort of, I then started going back to school and then I started being rude, disrespectful to my teachers because the teachers, to me, become authority. Um, and all these men that I was around wasn't academically clever, but they was all successful because I thought they were successful because they had a lot of money. And they wasn't, they didn't have an A in English or math. So I completely and utterly sort of disregarded my education. And I started truing it from school. And because my sort of teachers knew my home life, because they, um, they knew that what I was going back to every night, they knew that sort of... because my family, some of my family were in the national newspapers in this country um, for criminality, and they knew I was going back to that. They knew that I was at a very high risk. If if I can, if they basically just gave up on me completely, that like, I would probably end up getting involved in crime. And obviously my teachers didn't want that. So like they bent over backwards not to expel me or exclude me from school. And basically I got to 16 years old, um, and my mum pleaded with me to go to school to do my GCSEs. And I went there and done them just for my mum because my mum was getting upset and I'd done them and I went back to pick my GCSE results up at the end of the, like the, the summer holidays. And I remember my head of year was there and he opened up an envelope and he, he, and he, he basically pulled all my exam results out and I'd done no coursework. I just sat there the actual exams on the day. And he said, if only you would have applied yourself, what you could have achieved. And, and I, I managed to actually get some decent grades considering I did no coursework or anything like that whatsoever. And I remember he gave me these, these exam results and, and I walked down the end of my drive, like the school drive and I ripped them up and I chucked them in the bin because they meant nothing. They were completely and utterly irrelevant to me. And from that moment onwards, I made the decision that I was going to follow the path of all these other people, my stepdad um, and all of his friends. And, and, I made that, and I made that decision. And at 16 years old, I, I feel sort of embarrassed today to say it, but I went and bought a gun. And, and that's how perverse that world is, that a man in his late 30s, early 40s would sell a child a firearm. 
Um, but they did because it's money, and that's all they care about at the end of the day. A lot of people involved in that world, it's just money. Like, they don't care what I'm going to do with that gun. I, I was a 16-year-old teenager running around with a gun, but I could have killed anyone, I could have killed myself, but they don't care because at the end of the day, they just want to make money. Um, but at that time, I didn't see it like that. And, and yeah, and, and, and when I was 18, I, um, I ended up getting arrested for conspiracy to commit um, armed robbery. Okay, well that's that's not a pretty good start. Um, so yeah, you you um, you were incarcerated. Um, you spent uh, yeah quite a couple of years uh, inside. Um, what what made you decide at a certain point that you know I've got to turn things around. I, I whenever I get out here, I I can't go back to that same life. Um, I need to do something else with it. At what point did you did you start realizing that? Um, when 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 I first went to prison, I was a very I, I like I it, it pains me today to say it, but I I hated the system so much I was brought up to absolutely despise it. And mm-hmm. when I went to prison, it was very real to me. So when it, when it, when another person locks you in a room and shuts a metal door, like even though I put myself in that situation and I never ever ever shirked responsibility, I I no one ever made me do anything. I I made poor decisions on what I thought was right. Um, no one forced me to do anything. I made those choices. I led myself to be incarcerated. It was me to put myself in there. But at that moment in time, I didn't see it like that. Um, and I had a hatred towards the system. And I used to think the system had kidnapped me and, and put me in this environment. And I used to say to myself every day, this is not my life. And, and yeah, and, and sort of it only, the change in my life didn't come about through the length of time I was in prison because I was in there for nearly a decade of my life. I was in the prison for nearly a decade of my life, so it was, it was a very sort of long time. Um, and and that wasn't going to change me. That didn't change me. Like I was in there all that time, and nothing... I didn't even comprehend changing, because to me, my life was my life. Um, I, my identity was of a criminal. Everything I built up in my life, like the, the, what I thought I built up in my life, like uh, people respected me and, and because, because, because of my name, um, which, which now I realise how, how pathetic it was. But at that moment in time, I, I was brought up, all you've got is your name, and people will respect you because you've gone to prison, you kept your mouth shut. Mm-hmm. And sort of, it was only when my friend passed away, um, committing a robbery in the Netherlands, that it changed my life forever. And I remember sitting in my prison cell, and I, I got the news over the phone that my best friend had, had basically died committing a robbery in, in the Netherlands. And... And I, I can remember, I put the phone down and I looked at my life and it was the first time that anyone I'd ever cared about or loved had really had died that was close to me. Like I knew people that died years ago, um, but it, it always happened to other people. Um, it never happened to anyone I like personally really cared about. And you, you, you kind of think you're immune from it. And then when that happened to someone that you love and care about, like I put myself in that situation and realised how lucky I was to still be alive. And then I looked at my life at the moment as it was sitting in that prison cell and I'd done nothing with my life whatsoever. So that little boy that was growing up that wanted to be a winner, that wanted to be successful, that wanted to achieve something with his life, in fact, was a, a 26-year-old man serving a decade in a, in a prison cell in Britain, um, doing absolutely nothing with my life. And, and I had this moment of realisation how short life is. And, I, and, and it was like someone had put a tap on and my life was draining down the pan, like it was draining down the toilet. And I wasn't doing anything. And I remember sitting, and I was lost. Like I genuinely, I knew from that moment I would never again commit a crime in my life. I knew from that moment. I said I knew I was done. I'm done. I realised how sort of precious life was, and how I was wasting it in the pursuit of of what I was doing, of greed, um, of arrogance, of ego, and and I just relinquished it. Um, and yeah, like I said, I, I I was completely and utterly lost. I didn't know what I was going to do in my life. But I just knew it couldn't be what had led me to being in prison and what what was leading me to basically waste all my youth locked up in a in a prison cell. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so what do you do then? You you've got this completely uh, change in mindset. Um, wh- what are you able to do then in prison to to, yeah, to start that next chapter of your life? Well, when 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 I was when I was incarcerated, um, like I said, I, I wasn't an athletic child like I didn't I didn't have any aspirations to be an athlete when I was little um I didn't watch anything on the tv when I was a little boy 
and watch on go to the Olympics and think when I'm older, that's what I want to do. Like, to me, sport was quite alien. Like, I went to an all-boys school. It was very football-dominated. You wasn't good at football. You wasn't good at sport. That that was how I saw sport. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't very good at football. So when I'm in prison, um, how I used to cope with being... And I was locked up. Like, there was long periods of time where I was in a segregation unit for a whole year, locked up for 24 hours a day. Um, and to deal with that incarceration and especially segregation and isolation from other people, um, I started doing these sort of cell workouts. I mean, I do, I built up over the months and I used to do a thousand of each exercise, which was burpees, press ups, step ups, squat thrusts, um, and push ups. So it used to take me about an hour and a half to work through this circuit that I used to do. And obviously my body got stronger. I didn't realize I was getting fit because I didn't really know what fitness was. It, I lost weight. I got toned, but that was about it. Like I didn't, I didn't understand about physiology. I didn't understand about training zones or anything like that. I did it because I was locked up and it gave me purpose and it, and it made me use, it made, used to make me feel alive, like exercising, sweating, mm-hmm. my heart rate up, being locked in this little cell. And so when my friend passed away, um, I used to go down to the gym and used to get very limited gym access. Like you could only go twice a week. And there was a guy on a rowing machine and he was down there every single gym session. I went down there and he wasn't on my wing. So I went up to him one day and I said, how are you getting like, all these extra gym sessions? And he explained that he was rowing for charity and he was rowing a million metres for a children's hospice. And the prison officers would allow him to have extra gym and he could go down as much as he wanted to row his million metres. So I went to the prison officer in the gym and I asked him if I could do it. And he said, if you go back up on the wing and you get some sponsorship, um, we we'll give you a gym pass and you come down to the gym seven days a week and row as much as you want. So I went back, got some sponsorship, went back down, gave it to him. He gave me a note. And then I got in a rowing machine. I was 26 years old, never been in one in my life. Um, didn't really know what I was doing. I had to learn how to use the monitor and like, program it all in. Didn't realize I had to do that quite quick. And then I started rowing. And what I noticed when I was on this rowing machine, for that, and I started by rowing two hours a day, everyone left me alone. Like prisoners left me alone and I wanted to get away from them because I didn't want to listen to their, them talking about crime and mm-hmm. what they were going to do when they got out. I, I wanted to get away from them. And I always used to say, and I always say this, even to today, when you're locked up in prison and you want to change, it's kind of like being a drug addict or a recovering drug addict and being locked in a crack den. Like, you've, you've constantly got that temptation around you and you've constantly got those negative people around you. You can't get away from them. But when you're in prison, you're trapped. Like, you can't just get up and walk out and say, I've changed, let me out. It doesn't work like that. So I had to find a coping strategy. And the way I dealt with it was to sit on that rowing machine and row. And I used to look at the monitor and... I just used to be transfixed on it. And and it was a form of escapism. It completely and utterly got me out of prison. And anyway, by doing this, I'd I'd done the first million in a month. And then I noticed, obviously, the numbers on the RAM machine, they were getting quicker and quicker and quicker. But I didn't really understand. I didn't really get it. Like, I I obviously thought I'm I'm obviously, it's getting easier. So I'm obviously getting a little bit fitter. Mm -hmm. And then the second month, I asked if I could do it again. The prison officer said, keep raising money, keep doing it. Done it then. Third month. And I thought, right, this is great. If I keep doing this, it's going to help me get towards the end of my prison sentence. And when I got to three million, um, a prisoner said to me one day, do you know five million metres is 5,000 kilometres? And that's equivalent from around from Britain to the United States of America. And I remember thinking that's quite a cool thing to do, like on a round machine, to say I've rode from one side of the Atlantic to the other. So I, um, I asked the prison officer if I could keep doing it. He said yes. And then... I'm a great believer in life and destiny and I think everything happens for a reason. And I think what happened to me next, it can't be a coincidence. I I finished rowing 10,000 metres on the rowing machine. This gym officer walked behind me and he looked over my shoulder just as I finished rowing and he went, God, that is really fast. And and I went, is it? And I, obviously I'm, I'm not in the real world. Like I don't know what's fast, what's not. I've never been mm-hmm. around rowers or athletes. And he went away and come back a couple of days later and he gave me all these pieces of paper and had all the world and British records on an indoor rowing machine. And he gave them to me. And, he, and at that point, I could already break some of the British records on a rowing machine. And then I went away and a couple of days later, I asked him if I could do them. And he went away and he went and checked with the prison governor. He went and checked with the people that officiate the world records. They basically all gave the clear. And then after I, w- I was allowed to do it. So the first record I tried to break was for the marathon. I broke that purely by just sitting on a round machine every day. I didn't know what I was doing training-wise. I just got on there and pulled the handle towards my body and you put my legs down. Like, I had no, I didn't understand about technique or anything. And I broke that record by seven minutes. 
when I broke that record, everything I'd ever wanted as a little boy to be successful, to achieve something, to have a legacy, to, to do something in my life, not be average, to, to make something of myself, I felt that, that moment I broke that record. And I thought, I'm not average. Like, I've done something purposeful for my life. And from that moment onwards, I knew I could use my body as a vehicle to get me out of that world. And then I become absolutely consumed with becoming an athlete. And I started going down the prison library and I'd read every book I could get my hands on, on sports nutrition, on training. And I went to educate myself. And, then, and, the, and the funny thing was, when I, when I started having access to books and autobiographies of athletes, because they didn't interest me before, like marathon runners and, and people that rode across the Atlantic, Olympic rowers, and I was reading all these books. All the characteristics that I'd had as a little kid and, and as a man, like the drive, the focus, the will to win, the wanting to be successful, the wanting to, to achieve something, I noticed that like all of these athletes that have won medals at the Olympics and achieved amazing things in sport, they all, all had those same characteristics. The difference was when I was a little boy, mine completely got misguided into crime and it was literally destroying my life. And then when I realised I could click that over, and then I could still have that same thought process and apply it into sport, they're massive attributes and they're going to help me be successful. So it kind of, it just, over, it gave me an awareness. And within 16 months, I'd set um, eight British records and three world records on the indoor rowing machine. Okay. Um, so that's, that's pretty impressive. And, and uh, <clears throat> did you want to continue then doing that once you, once you get out of prison? <clears throat> was, was rowing just the one thing that kept you going? Yeah, so, so when, I, when I got released, when I, when I started breaking the, the records, I, again, I, I've always been an ambitious person and the athletic ability in my body, I wanted to do something with it because I kept thinking, I've had this since I was a little kid. I've never used it. I've broken it up at 26 years old. I've broken these records on a rowing machine and I want to do something when I get out. So my dream when I was in prison um, on H-Wing in, in a prison called Loudon Grange in Nottingham, was to become a professional athlete. And that was what my dream was. And, and I went on my first parole hearing in front of a judge and he said, what are you going to do on your release? And I said, I will become a professional athlete. And he laughed and they all laughed at me. There was a probation officer and there was some uh, criminal psychologist. And the judge went to me, Mr. McAvoy, your release plan is not based in reality. And, and I remember that I absolutely believed in myself and I knew I could do it. He didn't direct my release. He said I could move to an open prison where I'd be slowly introduced back into society because I've been in prison for so long. When I eventually did get released in 2012, I got released just after the, just a little bit after the Olympic Games in London. Mm -hmm. So I was watching all this on TV now. And I joined a rowing club in London called the London Rowing Club, which was a high performance centre at the time for lightweight rowing. So I, I went down there, I joined there. And like I, like I said, physiologically, my heart and lungs, I was putting out some of the, the same sort of power and numbers on an indoor rowing machine as what sort of an, uh, an international standard rower would put out on a rowing machine. Um, and considering, obviously, I took up the sport quite late in my life uh, of, indoor, uh, of rowing, indoor rowing, um, and I didn't really understand about training. I didn't have all those years of training that like, a lot of other people would have done. I sort of, on the rowing machine, I'd caught up with them relatively fast. But the problem is with a sport like rowing, it's kind of like swimming, very technical, um, and unless you've done it as a child, you've got no chance of turning professional at 30 years old. Like, you, you've got none. Like, to, to get to their professional level in rowing, you're going to the Olympics, and to go to an Olympics, you would have probably been rowing since you were 16 years old as a, as a male. So I had to make a, a tough decision because I made a lot of friends for rowing, and I thought, what do I do? Um, and when I was in prison, I, I, I saw an episode of Iron Man. I actually saw Kona on Channel 4 on a, a TV program called Trans World Sport. And I remember thinking to myself, when I get out of prison, I want to do an Ironman one day. So it was in my psychology. I knew this sport existed. And I went on Google and I Googled it and realized that you could turn professional at any age um, as long as you was fast enough. And in Britain, you have to be within 8% of the winning overall time of an Ironman race. So if you enter Ironman UK, you've got to finish within 8% of it, the, the overall winning time. And then you can deem to British triathlon that you're good enough to race the sport professionally. So I went on eBay. I went and bought a bike. Um, I went down to the Serpentine Lido, which is in Hyde Park in central London, and I bought a wetsuit um, for like £60 off eBay again. 
And I, I basically taught myself to swim. Um, I used to swim up and down, watch YouTube videos at night, go back down. And I, I, I bought a Garmin so I could see my swim splits were getting faster and faster and faster. And I entered Ironman UK six weeks out. I might have to get a charity entry because I, I, I missed out. And because I was doing, because when I got released from prison, um, I wasn't allowed to leave the United Kingdom. So the only race, Ironman race I could do was Ironman UK. Mm -hmm. which And it, it was only six weeks away. So I had to get a charity entry spot uh, and do it for that, basically, just, to, just so I could race it. And, and I did it on six weeks training and I turned up. And, and I remember when I finished it, like, I was running down that red carpet and it was one of the most emotional days of my life. Like, of all the records and everything I've done in prison, when I run down that carpet at Ironman UK for the first time, um, it was amazing. Like, it was like a dream come true. Like, I watched this, 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 this episode in prison of this sport and I said, I want to do that one day in my life. I didn't expect it to be as soon as it was. And then I was finally, I was running down the carpet and, and, I, and I made it happen. Um, and then I finished that race and I thought, right, this is it. I'm going to absolutely and utterly commit to this sport and I'm going to be as best as I can possibly be and start training for it properly and, and work my way and, and, and eventually turn professional at it. Um, and I've been on that journey ever since 2014. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and you definitely backed it up with uh, with a very solid performance there in, in, in Frankfurt in 2016 um, with, with a 9-hour, yeah. 10, 10 finish. So you're definitely on, on the right track. Um, <clears throat> but it, I guess it's taken a bit longer to, to actually get that pro license because... I think there's a bit of a difficulty for you now to, to find that balance between, yeah, first of all, training and, and, and doing all the necessary work for, for Ironman. And then all the things that you do on the side. I mean, yeah, you, you've written a book about your story. Um, you've, uh, you, you're, you're, you're traveling the country, speaking to, to kids at, at schools and universities. Um, yeah, is that something that you're trying to figure out now and, and uh, for the future and, and how to, you know, that you're still able to, to reach that goal of becoming a pro, pro triathlete? Yeah, like, I, 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 I'll be honest with you. It's been, like, last season, of, of all the years since... since I know I'm, I'm quite relatively new to the sport, um, but of all the seasons I had last year, as an athlete, it was it was probably one of my most disappointing seasons because I, 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 I massively underperformed. I basically... I was burning the candle at both ends. Um, and I, and I, have to, I have to be completely and utterly honest with myself about that. I massively underperformed for how fit I was earlier on in the season because by the time I got to race season, I was committing myself to so much stuff, um, lots of travelling. I got a lot of I got a lot of injuries and and I I, I, I got ill before I man UK again and and it was because of this sort of accumulative effect of of training 20 hours, 25, 30 hours a week, and then also then driving hundreds of miles a week around the country. Um, I understand in my situation that. I have a greater responsibility and, and, and purpose in life than just being fast at sport. Like, I, I, if I can stop one child going down the road that I went down as a young kid and making that poor decision because they've got terrible role models around them, um, I'll be a happy man. And it, and it, and it, it means far more to me than ever winning an Ironman race. But I'm in a situation where these children and what I'm doing every like when I go in and do these talks and stuff, the greater I can become as an athlete, the greater my story becomes to demonstrate to them that it doesn't matter where you come from in life, it's where you end up that counts. Mm -hmm. And by me being successful as an athlete and having a dream whilst I was in prison to turn professional in, that, in, in, in a sport as an athlete, if I can demonstrate and I do it, it shows anyone that anyone can do absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. Like, like I, I find it a massive honour and privilege that I, I can sit on the phone and say to you that, I'm one of the only, I am the only Nike-sponsored Ironman athlete in the world. If people, if I ever said that to people five, six years ago, they would have laughed at me and said I was a dreamer. But, but I've achieved that. And, and when I go in and talk to kids in schools and I can demonstrate that and go, I made all these bad decisions in my life. And they wasn't mistakes. They were bad decisions on what I thought was right by, by the people that sort of brought me up. And when I become older and I had a realisation that it actually isn't right to do that, and then I've gone on and made another set of decisions that has actually created a life and, and I've been successful, I can show kids that that Nike swoosh um, is, is attainable. Their dreams can become real when you make the right decisions in life and you don't choose the easy options, the shortcuts, the trying to get money quick and the easy option. And when you put your hard work in and dedication and you've got focus, 
that you can achieve the impossible and like you can and it doesn't necessarily mean as an athlete it isn't not everyone wants to be an athlete but what that what that Nike swoosh represents to me was a dream and and anyone can achieve their dreams and like I'm I want to keep demonstrating that by making that goal become a reality and once I've once I finish racing in July again like I'll go up and down the country and I will talk to as many children as I can. Um, I'm setting up my own charitable foundation that will um, raise money to then basically distribute money out to other charities that deliver grassroots schemes and projects to kids in in the cities and and basically throughout the United Kingdom that will allow children to have opportunities to have success in life. Mm -hmm. Because when I've gone around the country and I've done a lot of talks and stuff, there is a there is a massive massive issue um, of of children not having opportunities to be successful in life and that they've got nothing like there's there's nothing and and a lot of them have been discarded and 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 they're basically they're, you're already on the they're already on the path at a very young age to basically fail in life because they're being given up on as children and and I want to do everything I can and use the platform and influence that I've ended up having in, like with politicians and with sports brands to to galvanise and, and, and shine a light on this and, and try to do something and, and help as many of them as I possibly can. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. And that's also uh, the main reason why I, why I, had, I wanted you on the show. I mean, the, the story is, is is pretty well known, I guess, within within the the, the, the community. And uh, but it needs to be it needs to be continuously told, and um, it needs to be uh, yeah, it needs to be spread out as much as possible. And it, it also reminds me a bit of the, the Lionel Sanders uh, case. I mean, he. He came oh, from a, from a normal b- background, I guess, but he's he's got that drug um, um, history and and yeah, also was completely on the ground and and, and picked himself up and, and yeah became this world class athlete now. So um, I guess stories like like Lionel's and yours definitely are a, a massive inspiration for a lot of kids. Yeah, he, uh, he he's a, yeah like he's a massive inspiration to me. Yeah. Um, I, I watch yeah, it, I think it's phenomenal what the man's achieved. It's absolutely incredible, yeah. incredible. Uh, yeah, and, and imagine like with your talent and, and your physical your physiology that you had. I mean, if, if you would have picked it up a bit sooner, um, yeah, what what might have, what made it impossible even in rowing? Yeah, yeah, and do you know what? Like that that's I, I of all of all the things that I do do today, like I, I work as um I'm I basically I'm on a committee of a of a of a charity in this country called Sports Aid, mm-hmm. and it basically it allots and grants money to children. Um, that are, are very athletically gifted, but they're from environments where, like, their mums and dads haven't got the cash to facilitate them doing their sport. They haven't got the money for them to go co- for their coaching fees, for travel, to get to competition. Mm-hmm. And, and, I'm, and I've been very fortunate to be asked to sit on this like panel that makes decisions on on a lot in these grants to to young athletes um, in the United Kingdom that have the potential to go on and, and represent GB at a World or Olympic Games. Um, and 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 I say it's such an honour, and, and I love doing it. And and even like I, I'm fortunate myself now, where I can mentor athletes. So so when I do school talks, um, I talk to PE teachers, and sometimes, and, and it's happened now. Like I'm mentoring a young um, a young kid um, that's a hundred meter sprinter, and he, he lives in Essex, and he's the fastest 13 year old in the United Kingdom. He runs a hundred meters in 10.9 seconds, um, and it's been amazing to be part of his journey and facilitating and aiding him for all the contacts that I've built up in sport um, and helping him and guiding him and, and giving him advice when he needs it. Um, and, and it's amazing to be able to go and do school talks and then see kids and, and help children realise their dream. And then what, what's amazing out of it is, is every time I work with these kids, I always say the same thing. One day you're going to be in my situation and I want you to go in and do something and give something back and you pass the baton over to the next kid and you help them and you lift them up because I'm a great believer in life. I think if you're successful, you have an obligation to help bring other people up and, and help other people become successful. And and I've done so much damage when I was a young man with my life and I caused so much misery to other people's lives and I was very selfish. And it's sort of my way of sort of giving something back um, and trying to prevent other people from making decisions that I made that are going to affect other people's lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that must be, it must be an amazing feeling to be able to do that. Um, so, so what are your plans for 2018? Uh, any, any races that, that are already fixed? Yeah, so I'm doing um, Ironman Staffordshire, 70.3, uh, and that's in June. And then I'm doing Challenge Roth on the 1st of July. 
Yeah. Uh, and then after Challenge Roth, I'm racing Ironman Hamburg, which is three weeks later. Yeah. So I'm going to try to get the 8% at Staffordshire and Ironman Hamburg because I think Roth... Roth, I think Roth would be a bit of a. I, 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 I've got a lot of confidence, but you have to be realistic and think. When I do challenge Roth, the likelihood is Jan Fredino is going to turn up and break the world record, and I, <laughs> I think to get with eight, 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 to get within eight percent of his winning time would be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a bloody fast course, but it's it's an amazing course. Yeah, maybe you should uh, use that one just and, and, and enjoy enjoy the day out. Uh, yeah, I've, I've rested as well. It might have been ten years ago, more, yeah, more than ten years ago now, but. Yeah, once you get up that solar hill and you get that massive amount of people that are lining that climb, it's it's uh, it gives you goosebumps riding up, and it's it's an amazing place, and it's it's, it's I think it's the best race in the world. So go out, enjoy that one, build as much fitness as you can, and then put the hammer down in Hamburg. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's the um that's the goal. Yeah, well, good but stuff. we all know in sport it doesn't it doesn't always play out how you <clears> want it to, but you just you just got to put yourself in the best situation to, yeah. to perform on the day. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, we're keeping out uh, an eye out for you, and we'll uh, we'll definitely uh, look at the results. So, um, yeah, good luck with with, with uh, preparation and uh, thank yeah, you. Th- thanks again for your time. Um, how can people get in touch with you if they want to? Uh, jo- so I, I've I've got a, I've got a website. Um, people can go on my website. So it's the it's a it's at the real McAvoy, mm-hmm. um, and I'm on Twitter. And I'm on like all that sort of social media, like Instagram. But like my website is on my way. So you just go the real McAvoy, and it, and then my website will come up. And there's like a little email box, there and people can send messages, or if they want to contact me, you can contact me through that. Yeah, cool stuff. I'll put that link up on the show notes page. Um, yeah, feel free to give some love to your uh, your sponsors. Uh, well, you can only really give love to um to Nike, <laughs> which is which is still like I still have to pinch myself sometimes and. To, to be under the, the umbrella of some of the greatest athletes on the planet, um, and who my wetsuit sponsors again, phenomenal um, support. Uh, but uh, yeah, that it's just I, I, I find it very humbling that not only do they sponsor me as an athlete, but they they are allowing me to help other kids, mm-hmm. and they're facilitating me making other kids' dreams come true by like, giving me kit to give to kids and, and and stuff like that. So it isn't just them giving me stuff for me to be fast. It's about they completely and utterly bought into what I'm doing yeah. away from the sport as well. And they want to be part of that, which is, which is phenomenal and yeah. very, very humbling. Yeah. That's the way it should be. Um, anything else you want to plug? Oh no, no, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Well, one final uh, question just to finish it off. Um, if you could sit on a bench uh, in, in, in a park uh, somewhere in London there and, and chat for an hour with anyone from the, from the past or the present, who would it be? Um, if I could sit on a bench, I would, Probably, I probably, I'd suppose, I'll probably have to say, obviously, because there's a similarity between me and him. Like in the context that we was both in prison, um, I would probably talk like to talk to someone like Nelson Mandela. Okay. Uh, and I, I find, yeah, because obviously, what the man achieved from from where he'd come from, from yeah, like he spent three times longer than what I did in prison, and to come out and and, and do what he did with his life was is, is truly remarkable and. Yeah, I'll probably Nelson Mandela. Yeah, yeah, that will be. will definitely be an interesting chat. Well, thanks again for your time, uh, John. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. All right, junkies. Thanks for listening to this episode with uh, John McAvoy. Now, if you like these little interviews and don't want to miss any future episodes, just head over to iTunes or Stitcher and simply subscribe to the show. I would also like to thank everyone who has left a rating and a review there. Uh, it's much appreciated. And if you haven't done so yet, yeah, please consider leaving me one and uh, help me grow the show. We're also on Spotify, so if that's your preferred medium, uh, just search for Endurance Junkie Podcast in the search bar and you will find me no problem. And yeah, if you have suggestions for possible future guests, uh, shoot me an email at peter at junkiepodcast.com. That's peter at junkiepodcast.com. And I'll try to make it happen. All right, thanks again for listening and I'll look you join me next time. Cheers.